be talking out of Ezra chapter 3 today. We're talking about when the Israelites returned from exile and what they did to go from a disparate people in exile to be the people of God together again. What that looked like, all the steps they took. We're doing that for the next couple of weeks as well, so look forward to that. If you want to read ahead, read the book of Ezra. You'll get the spoiler alert for next week. <clears throat> Excuse me. But today we're talking about what most of us have probably been talking about in our own homes for the last several weeks, getting back to normal. You've probably said that at least once this week. I have, several times. What's it going to look like when we can get back to normal? And as we listen to different uh, uh, governor's messages and the president speaking and everybody's talking about phase one and two and 18 and however many phases there are going to be of reopening and what's it going to look like? When will we get back to normal? Because it's what we so desperately want as we're sitting in our homes and schools are closed and I can't go to wherever I usually go and all the restaurants I want to go. I would just want to go have cheese dip at the Mexican restaurant and I can't and it makes me sad. And I just want to get back to normal. But what we all know and acknowledge to be true is that normal isn't going to be the same as it was before because we've gone through a traumatic experience as a people. We're going through something very difficult and different now than many of most of us have ever experienced personally. And when we go back to normal, it won't be the same as it was before. What we've gone through will have profoundly changed us. And so we look forward, instead of going back to normal or going back to the old way, we look forward to going back to whatever the new normal will be and settling in to what, we're, what it's gonna look like in the future. And for some things, we want those things to go back exactly as they were. And some things, we know we want those things to look a little bit different than they did before. But even as we look forward to going to the new normal and getting back into a routine and settling in and having things be normal, if you're anything like me, you carry a little bit of anxiety as well. Because I've kind of gotten used to things now. I've kind of settled into the new COVID-19 lifestyle. And I don't quite know when we get to our new normal, what things are gonna look like they did before and what things are gonna change and how that's gonna affect me. And it makes me a little bit anxious. And I feel a little bit overwhelmed at the prospect of trying to figure it all out. Trying to figure out what's life gonna look like when we get back to the new normal. And I think if I can read into the scripture, in Ezra chapter 3, as the people of Israel returned from exile, I imagine that they were going through, even more so than we are, that feeling of excitement and anxiety. The fear and the trembling and the, the just joy. Because if I can give you the really quick and unscientific version of the story of the people of Israel as we talk about them in Ezra... We've got this nation of people who were the people of God living in the promised land together. And they were doing great and then they'd mess up. And they would mess up over and over and over again. And every time they would mess up enough, God would stop protecting them. Someone would come in and oppress, enslave, or carry them away. And then they would cry back out to God and God would rescue them again. We'd do this over and over and over again until they were taken over, brought out of the promised land, exiled, separated, and the people of Israel, the nation of Israel fell. And when the nation of Israel fell, the physical place just absolutely was decimated. The wall was broken down. The temple, it says not one stone lay upon another. It was gone. Everything was gone and the people were carried away into exile. And they lived for decades in another nation, under another king, who worshipped a different god. And so the people of Israel have been separate and away from their home and unable to worship their God the way that they should be allowed to, the way that they want to. They're alone. Though there may be other people of Israel near to them, there's this feeling of isolation, being surrounded by people who are different, who are so different, who don't understand the God they serve, the God they love, who don't recognize their religious practices. 
They had no assurance that they would even be allowed to worship God because it all fell on the whim of a king who was not theirs. So sometimes it was fine and sometimes it wasn't. Think about Daniel. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sometimes they could worship and sometimes they couldn't. Sometimes it was fine and sometimes they risked their lives. And everything rested on the whim of a king that wasn't their king. In a nation that wasn't their nation who worshipped a god that wasn't their god. Until finally, after decades of crying out and wishing and hoping and praying that they could go home, the king finally said, you can go. He spoke to Ezra and said, Ed, take your people, return to your nation, and restore worship to your God. Outstanding. We're all so excited. Let's go. Let's go now. Can we worship him now? And they get there. And everything that anybody who could have remembered anything about Israel was gone. The temple is gone. The wall is gone. The nation of Israel is gone. We have no established order, no practices, no government, no infrastructure, no temple, nothing. How do we even begin to do this? And that's kind of where we're starting in chapter 3. We've read it once, I'm going to read it again, just because I love reading the fun names. But we're looking at Ezra chapter 3, we're starting in verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. When Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. There are a few things that I want to notice about that passage of scripture and talk about how that applies to us. First thing I want to notice is that when they came back to Israel, they came back to the promised land, they came back together, they began by returning to worship. They put their first things first, and they said, the first thing we have to do as a people is worship God. Some of the people of Israel who had been in exile would have worshipped God the entire time, though it would have had to have been adjusted for not having a temple. Because worship of God happened in the temple. We would go to the temple in Jerusalem and we would offer sacrifice and we would worship God there, but there was no temple. Not just they couldn't go, there wasn't one. And some people, while in exile, would have abandoned or forgotten worship of God. Just felt like we can't do that here. There's no way. Some of the people of Israel probably had never worshipped God. And so when Ezra and the leaders came back to Israel, they said, the first thing we need to do is worship God. But to worship God could have meant any number of things. Because worship of God would have happened in the temple. The last time that anybody could possibly have remembered worshiping God in Israel, it would have been at the temple as it stood in all of its glory. It would have meant going through these several rituals and practices, going through the temple and doing temple things. And we don't need to get into all the details of what that looked like. You can read about that in the Old Testament another day. There's a lot in there. But to worship God at the temple would have meant certain practices that they would have expected. Would have meant that it looked a certain way. But the temple was gone. How can we worship God if there's no temple? Which is the second thing that we want to look at here. They did not start by building the temple.
which they could have done. They could have said, our worship of God won't be right, won't be proper until we have a temple standing at this place, full and complete with the full complement of priests and Levites. We want to make sure that everything is in place before we ever worship God. So we'll start by laying the foundation for the building. That's what we could have done as the people of Israel. But it says before the temple foundation was laid, they started by building the altar and sacrificing to God. They started with worship before everything was ready. And when they worshiped, when you read this passage, they did not half-heartedly worship. They made no excuse to limit the number of things they needed to do in worship. They did not say, well, we're supposed to offer 10 sacrifices, but really we can only afford five today. God will understand the temple stands in ruins. They offered everything that they were supposed to offer according to the law of Moses. And Moses was a long time ago, which is the last thing we want to notice. When they came back and the temple was in ruins, they could have gone to the most recent memory of what worship looked like. They could have gone and said, well, who are the oldest folks around here? Let's ask them what it looked like when we worshiped in the temple. And let's try our best to replicate that. But instead of doing that, they went all the way back to the inception of the law. When they first became a nation together under the leadership of Moses and his brother Aaron and the Levites, when God first gave them the law and, the, and how to worship, the instruction book in Leviticus that tells them which offerings to offer and when to offer them and how to offer them and all the things that you do, they went all the way back and they said, we're not going to worry about what we did last. We're going to worry about what God told us to do first. Because before there was a temple, there was a law. And before there was a law, there was a God to be worshipped. Before Moses, there was Abel offering sacrifice to God. Pleasing sacrifice to God. And so they went all the way back. Said, if we're going to do this, we're going to start with worship. We're going to make sure that our worship is right that we do everything that we can and are supposed to do to worship God properly. And to know what that is, we're going to go back to what God told us to do in the beginning. We're not going to worry about making sure it looks like it did before. Because what are the chances that we were wrong? But we're going to go all the way back and we're going to look at what is worship? What should it be? What is at the heart of worship? We're going to go to back to the very beginning, to the very basics of worship. And at the heart of worship is honoring God. Now, our temple still stands. The building is still here. We don't have to worry about that. But we've gone through an experience where all of the structures and programs and things that we do at the Salvation Army, we've had to stop or change. And we've been fortunate that we live in 2020 where we can worship digitally and we can come together as a people in a new and interesting digital way. But in a lot of ways, we've been struggling to be the people of God together during this time. As the Israelites, when they were exiled, they were still God's people individually. But to come together and be his people together would have been hard to impossible. And that's where we find ourselves, in this place where we want to be the people of God together, but we can't be together. But soon, a day is coming when we can come back together and we can be the people of God together again. And we need to answer for ourselves some questions about what that means to look like. What does that mean? As we come back to worship together, as we look forward to coming back and having church together in person indoors where it's, you know, 100 degrees less hot. As we look forward to coming back to have Bible study together, to sit around a table and open the word of God and talk about what it means and how we understand it and what that means about how we should live. 
as we look forward to being able to bring our children back for youth programs and teaching the young people that God has blessed us with what it means to be God's people, as we look forward to all of those opportunities, we need to remember, like the people of Israel, to put first things first, to make sure that all of our programs, rather than concerning ourselves with what did they look like three months ago when we had to stop, but to start at the basic, to start and say, what does God want for this to be? How can this be worship to God? How can God be at the center of everything we do at the Salvation Army? Because it's going to be different. We know that. We can pretend like everything's going to be exactly the same, but it won't. And when we acknowledge that, when we know that to be true, we can become overwhelmed at the thought of, well, what should it be? Where should I start? If I can't start from a place of what did I do three months ago, where can I begin? Well, like the people of Israel, when they returned to Jerusalem to implement worship to God again, we can begin at the beginning. We can begin with the scripture. We can begin with who God is. And start from that place and say, okay, that's who God is. That's who he wants me to be. That's who he wants the Salvation Army to be. And if we're going to be the people of God together, finally, then what should our programs, what should our structures, what should our infrastructure look like? How can we start worshiping God together again? 